Okay, in this video, I'm going to give you a basic overview of the oscope and a demonstration of how to do some uh, basic things with it. Uh, the first thing to, to do is to recall how the Sotoa spreadboard is connected inside. Um, so here, uh, I've replaced the sticker on the back of the breadboard with a piece of polycarbonate, so you can actually see what's going on here. Um, you can see that these um, tie points in the middle are grouped together like this, vertically, in this orientation, in groups of five, separated by this line in the middle, or this gap in the middle, and that these um, the tie points along the top and bottom are tied together in a long distribution rail for distributing the power supplies. So that's an important thing to keep in mind when you're working with this auto spreadboard. And the O-scope over here uh, plugs into the breadboard, and these pins here and here are um, supplying power to the power distribution rails. And they're labeled in the silk screen here. You can see ground is the bottom one, 3.3 volts is the next one up. And then we have uh, at the very top, 5 volts, and then 2.5 volts. This 2.5 volts is um, basically half of the 5 volts, um, and the 5 volts is whatever uh, V bus is that comes in from the USB port that you happen to be plugged into. So it's not going to be exactly 5 volts and not exactly 2.5, but it'll be pretty close. Um, here, along the top here, we have this row of pins, which is the digital header. We have another place where you can get 3.3 volts, which is the power supply for the digital circuitry um, on here, the digital I.O. pins ground, and then four digital outputs. And uh, we'll be using these later on for doing things like supplying pulse width modulated outputs to um, various circuits or something like that. Um, down here is the analog I.O. header. Uh, we have channel one of the oscilloscope, channel one plus and one minus, channel two plus and two minus. Measuring a voltage is a differential measurement here. And so you have two inputs, a plus and a minus. And then we have uh, VO is the offset voltage for the waveform generator output. We won't be often using that, but it's available. It's sort of the zero level of the uh, waveform generator. And then we have here uh, the waveform generator output. And the waveform generator output is capable of generating a uh, DC output, a sine wave, a square wave, and a triangle wave. And you can vary the amplitude and the offset um, the amplitude can be varied from 0 to 2.5 volts, and the offset can be varied from 0 to 5. And uh, outside of the, the range of 0 to 5 volts, uh, the, the sum of the waveform and the offset will clip. Um, and so that defines uh, the waveform generator output. The frequency can be, can be adjusted from below 1 hertz up to about 200 kilohertz. And, um, and so that's, this is where we will be connecting uh, wires to, to measure various parts of our circuit and to deliver a stimulus. Um, over here I've got some components in my breadboard that I'm going to use to demonstrate various things we can do with the oscope. So here I have two uh, one kilo ohm resistors uh, connected uh, in series with each other which will give me a uh, fixed voltage divider ratio of one half to one kilo ohm resistors. One end is connected here to the ground rail and then these two uh, leads are connected into the same group of five, the same column of five tie points, so they are connected together. And then up here I can connect a wire to the top end uh, there. Here I have a 15.9 kilo ohm resistor in series with a, a 10 nanofarad capacitor, and the 10 nanofarad capacitor is connected to ground through this wire here. And then I have a 5 kilo ohm trim potentiometer, which I'm going to be using as a variable voltage divider. And um, one side, one end is connected to ground, the wiper is in the middle, and then the other end of the, the potentiometer is here. And then I've got a blue LED uh, connected to ground through a one kilo ohm resistor, which I'll be using to demonstrate uh, the digital outputs. So you can actually see something with the digital outputs. So you can see here, um, power is applied, and you can see that because there's a green indicator LED that's underneath the board here that's illuminating the, 
the 3.3 volt rail here. Um, and that indicates that, uh, that the board is powered. Okay, so we're going to launch the Oscope software, which is an app. So there it is right there. And it's probably a good idea to make this window a bit wider. Oh. Try that again. And then I'm gonna adjust this down a little bit so you can actually see what's going on here. You probably wanna connect some wires up. So I'm gonna use black wires and I'm gonna connect uh, the negative channels negative measurement channels up to ground for the time being. So it's one minus and two minus. And I'm going to use a yellow wire for channel one plus and a blue wire for channel two plus. And I'm going to connect a green wire up to the waveform generator output there. Okay. So, um, when you first launch the, the Oscope software, what you see here is a typical oscilloscope plot where we have channel one and channel two on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. So an oscilloscope provides you with a view of waveforms as a function of time. Uh, that's sort of the normal view that you get with an oscilloscope. And um, we have these little uh, arrows here at various points around the edge of, the, of the, the window. And those are little pullouts that we can um, pull out that have a little toolbar. So uh, for instance, this one over here on the right controls whether or not I'm uh, acquiring waveforms with the oscilloscope and some things about how, the, how the, the oscilloscope is triggering. We'll cover that in a little bit. If I want to save the waveforms, this little, this little button up here allows me to save the waveforms. <coughs> I can uh, put some measurement cursors here, and I can adjust the, the, the range that the vertical scale is in for each of the channels, and also um, the sampling rate and uh, the sort of horizontal scale here. Um, and so to start acquiring waveforms continuously, I can uh, press this uh, repeat button and hit the play button, and you can see I start to acquire some waveforms. Um, my sampling rate up here is one mega sample per second, and um, if I'd like to decrease that a little bit, and I think I will want to do that, I can use this little left arrow down here, which reduces the sampling rate, and I think 100 kilosamples per second right now is, is going to be good for us. Um, so uh, right now I have uh, the home view, which at 100 kilosamples per second, ranges from minus 2.5 milliseconds to plus 2.5 milliseconds. And that represents about a third of the total sample buffer that's available to me. And if I like, I can zoom in and out in the horizontal axis here by this little toolbar. I can zoom, uh, zoom out here and you can see that my sample buffer goes actually quite a bit further than the plus or minus 2.5 milliseconds. So the plus or minus 2.5 milliseconds is a roughly one third of the total sample buffer. It actually extends from, let's say, minus, uh, minus seven and something to plus seven something uh, in this range. It's basically 1,500 samples at 100 kilosamples per second gives me uh, the total sort of sample buffer size. and um, and so the normal view is here uh, zoomed in a bit. So each zoom in and zoom out s s zooms in and out by uh, basically a factor of root two. And so if I click on it twice, I should get two plus and minus five. And if I do it four times, I get to plus and minus 10. So you'll notice I'm not changing the sampling rate when I zoom in and zoom out here. I'm just sort of changing my view into the uh, sample buffer. Uh, I can do the same thing in the vertical scale. Here the home view is plus or minus 10 because I'm in the plus or minus 10 volt range. Uh, and I can zoom in. So if I'm only dealing with voltages between 0 and 5, I might like to zoom in 
uh, by four steps and then adjust the offset which I can do by panning up and down so I can put the zero level down here at the bottom so the zero level is indicated over here on the left hand side by this uh, yellow arrow for channel one and this uh, cyan arrow for channel two so I can change which channel is currently being displayed on the vertical axis by clicking on these buttons up here so channel one is selected here channel 2 is selected here so I'm still zoomed out to plus or minus 10 volts here you can see I can still see the zero level uh, by this little yellow arrow here and so if I want to zoom channel 2 in to plus or minus two and a half and then move down I can select channel 2 and then zoom in to plus or minus two and a half which is a five volt span and then pan down so that I'm in the range of zero to five So let me select channel one again and uh, put that away. Now I can uh, use this little pull out here to measure voltages, like a almost like a digital voltmeter. So you can see the channel one is sort of the average value of the voltages that are being sampled here. And so you can see they're hovering around 1.64 or something. If I take channel one and connect it up to the plus five volt rail can see it's about measuring 5.05 something. If I change it down to 2.5 volt, it's about 2.52, which is about half of what it was before, up at the 5 volt rail. If I move it down here to 3.3, you can see it's yeah 3.3. If I like, I can, say, connect my voltage divider up to the 5 volt rail here and I can measure the top with channel 1 and the midpoint with channel 2 and it's about 5 and 2.5 and all very comforting so if you need to measure voltages you can do that you can also measure voltages differentially so if I wanted to for instance measure just the voltage across the top resistor with channel 1 I can move the black lead that was connected to ground so that it's on the bottom end of this one resistor and now channel one is telling me the voltage across the top resistor here in my voltage divider so they're both about 2.52 okay so these voltages these measurements are differential if I swap the plus and the minus lead, it should show me minus 2.5 volts, which it does. Hooray. So let me go back to ground, with this, and now let's do something a little bit more interesting with our voltage divider. Let's connect the waveform generator output up to the top end and now you can see it's measuring about two and a half volts by default when I first plug this in my waveform generator is putting out a DC level at about two and a half volts now I can change that let me leave that out here just for a second I can change that with this pull out over here in the middle on the left end that pulls out the waveform generator control pane and right now you can see that the waveform that's generated is uh, a DC level and I can change it to a sine wave a square wave or a triangle wave and I have a control point over here on my waveform preview which is this uh, little dot here if I grab a hold of that I can move it up and down that's how I can adjust the offset and so if I made it say three volts, you can you can see that the the yellow waveform, which is measuring the top end of the voltage divider, and also the waveform generator output, is giving me uh, three volts, and the midpoint here of my voltage divider is giving me half of that. If I like, I can change to a sine wave, and now I have a second control point, which lets me move the amplitude 
and the frequency, or the amplitude and the period, of the waveform relative to that offset. So I can move the offset up and down, and I can adjust the period. So I can go can put 10 cycles of the waveform in here, or I can put basically a quarter of the waveform in here. And so I get some sort of uh, range that I can adjust here, but I can also use these left and right arrow buttons here to change the frequency as well. And this changes it in core steps. So right now the you can see the horizontal scale of this preview window is showing me a period of one millisecond. And if I use the greater than, it changes it to two, five, ten. So this basically lets me change things on a logarithmic scale, one, two, five, ten, twenty, fifty, a hundred, and so on. And so if I want to go and expand the waveform, I use the greater than, or the right arrow. If I want to make the waveform faster, which means a shorter period, I use the, the, uh, the left arrow. So let's let's go with, um, oh, I don't know, say 100, well, let's do 500 hertz. And you can see that the waveform is kind of scrolling past here. Um, I can fix that. Uh, if I put the, the, this panel away, I can change how the triggering is done. So the way that a, an oscilloscope um, establishes a, a sort of a stable time point is it looks for where um, the waveform that is, it's triggering off of crosses through a certain voltage level. And that voltage level is called the trigger level, and that's indicated by this little yellow arrow here on the right-hand side of the screen. So I can pick that up and I can move it. And if I can move it inside the yellow waveform, you can see now all of a sudden it's not scrolling past anymore. As soon as I move it outside of that level, it starts scrolling past again. And you can see when it stabilizes, I get a zero point in time that's indicated by this white arrow up here in the middle of the screen. It's basically where the yellow waveform crosses through this level. I can, if I adjust this down, you will note that that point where the waveform changes kind of moves to the right a little bit, and it moves back to the left, and so on. And so you can see that my divider is taking my nice sine wave that's centered around three volts, and it's dividing it in half, so that this waveform has half the amplitude, and it's centered around uh, 1.5 volts. So if I pull my waveform generator control pane out here again, I could change the waveform to a square wave, a triangle wave. And um, let me make it a triangle wave. And let me move the offset down here to two and a half. And let me move the amplitude up to, so that's going from almost zero to five. I can't get it exactly there. But that's pretty close. And now I'm going to try one of these other panes here. So if I pull out the top one, I get something called an XY plot, which is a plot of channel 1 versus channel 2, or channel 2 versus channel 1, parametric in time. So this gives me um, something which is called a voltage transfer characteristic of my voltage divider, uh, which, you know, given the voltage divider rule, um, I would expect to be a straight line with a slope of one half that goes through the origin. And so um, I can, if I like, uh, swap the x and the y axes here, because by default it's plotting channel one on the vertical axis and channel two on the horizontal axis. And my input is really channel channel one, so can hit the, the button that swaps the X and Y, and I can also pull out this little pan and zoom. Now the pan and the zoom uh, pans and zooms in uh, this pane instead of the main view of the oscilloscope. So I just zoomed in uh, channel 2. Let me zoom in 
and shift channel two down so that it's zero and goes from zero to five. And let me do the same thing for the x-axis. So that my scale is basically a box from zero to five. And you can see that this is nice, a nice straight line like we would expect from the voltage divider ratio. And it goes over two grid points for every one it goes up in the vertical direction. So the slope of this line is basically one half, which is all very nice. Um, you can also do a similar thing with my potentiometer. So if I swap this over to my potentiometer, and I move channel one and channel two so that channel one and the waveform generator output are um, on the top end of the potentiometer and the channel two is in the on the wiper, which is the middle midpoint. Right now it's set to about a halfway, and so I would get a voltage divider that's fairly similar to my fixed voltage divider. And if I like, I can take this and I can twist it over toward the waveform generator side, the top side, and I get something where you can see my yellow and blue waveforms in the background there are very close to each other, and I get something that's very close to a divider ratio of one and my slope is pretty much uh, one for one here on my XY plot. If I like, I can also adjust the divider so that it's close to zero by moving all the way to the other side. And you can see that the XY plot just changes the slope continuously as I adjust the dial. If I wanted to adjust it to about a third, I could do that. Okay, so that's the XY plot. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Um, I have here, um, like I said, a 15.9K resistor in series with a 10 nanofarad capacitor. That gives me, um, depending on how I hook it up, a low pass filter with a time constant of about a millisecond and I can connect up channel 1 and the waveform generator to the uh, input or the top end of the resistor and the channel 2 output to the capacitor, the midpoint here, which gives me a low pass filter. And let's suppose I go back to my waveform generator and I switch to a sine wave and let me reduce the amplitude here. Oh, I don't know, maybe down there and you can see that if I wanted to go to a lower frequency I really should be adjusting the sampling rate. So if I turn the sampling rate down some I can really change the frequency to a lower frequency. So there's a hundred hertz There's 20 hertz. And so at 20 hertz, if I like I can zoom zoom out in time here without changing the sampling rate. You can see it's having a little bit of trouble establishing the trigger. Change the trigger to about two and a half. But you can see that these waveforms are more or less uh, the same size and they're they're pretty close to in phase. They're not exactly in phase with each other. Um, let me zoom, zoom back in a little bit here. And now if I increase the frequency, you can see as I increase the frequency, something starts to happen. Increase my sampling right here. can see that now the blue waveform is starting to shrink and there's starting to be a little bit more uh, delay or phase shift between the two.
and as I increase the frequency further, you can see that now I'm starting to really get my blue waveform, my output is starting to really drop off in amplitude, and the, uh, the phase shift is approaching a quarter of a cycle, which is 90 degrees. And this is kind of typical of a low pass filter, so the lower frequencies are passed straight through without being uh, changed very much, whereas the higher frequencies, uh, they start to be attenuated once I get past this sort of one millisecond mark. Um, the XY plot is fairly interesting. If I show you the, an XY plot of the situation, um, what you'll note is that when I'm at low frequencies, the two waveforms are in phase with each other, and it just basically traces out a line here, which is about at a 45 degree angle with a slope of one. So I increase the frequency, it starts to become an ellipse, so that my, my uh, I've got two sine waves and they're phase shifted, and so the ellipse starts to actually rotate and change its uh, eccentricity and as I get to higher and higher frequencies, the output, which is on the vertical scale here, gets smaller and smaller. And so um, I'm getting some aliasing effects here. So instead of seeing a nice ellipse, I'm seeing this kind of polygon. If I should increase the sampling rate, it would turn into a nicer ellipse. Um, but you can see that this is going to be approaching basically a horizontal line. So that's kind of cool. Um, if I switch over to put the XY plot away, if I switch over to a square wave, you can see this sort of step response where I get an exponential approach to the final level and I get an exponential approach to the, uh, the, uh, the final level and it ping pongs back and forth with an e to the minus t over one millisecond kind of approach. So if I wanted to, uh, if I like this particular view and I wanted to save this waveform, I could hit the pause button to stop the acquisition. I don't have to do that. And I can hit the save button. And let me put this um, on my desktop. And let me save this as um, low pass step dot csv if I hit the save button I get my csv file and you can see what I get out here is basically uh, a comma separated variable file which I could bring into MATLAB or read into a Python uh, environment or Excel or whatever you like to use to plot things. I uh, basically time for channel 1, channel 1, time for channel 2, channel 2 uh, as uh, four columns here. And uh, if I continue my acquisition, um, if I wanted to, I can also do a Bode plot. And if I click on this little arrow down here, it switches to a different screen, which is um, Network Analyzer. And um, here I have uh, the two Bode plots on the same actual axes. I've got on the left axis the gain. I've got the right axis uh, the phase angle, the phase difference between the two signals. This pullout on the left here allows me to change uh, the range of frequencies that my my uh, sweep is going to encompass. So if I wanted to, I could go, from, let's say, from 10 hertz. This is logarithmic. You'll notice it goes 1, 2, 5, 10. And if I like, I can uh, uncheck that, and I get a more continuous uh, choice here, but it's still logarithmic. So let me go up to 10. My end frequency, 100 kilohertz, is going to be fine, 101 points. DC amplitude, or rather an offset of 2.5 volts and a peak amplitude of 1 volt. That's all good. Go over here. Uh, I want to put 
little point markers there to show the, the points. And I'm going to hit the play button. And now it's basically applying a series of sine waves, the frequencies that I've indicated. And it's measuring the amplitude of the input and the amplitude of the output, and the phase difference between them. And it's plotting them in a traditional sort of Bode plot way. And so uh, you can see that at low frequencies, below 1 kilohertz, the gain is 0 dBs, like we expect. The phase shift is 0 degrees. And then as I approach that 1 kilohertz um, corner frequency, I start to attenuate at 20 decibels per decade. So every increase in frequency by a factor of 10 gives me a 1 decade or 20 decibel attenuation. At the, the corner frequency, I should be at about um, minus 45 degrees. If I go over here at 1 kilohertz, I'm at about minus 45 degrees, which is what we expect. And asymptotically, I approach minus 90. And if I like, I can save that Bode plot as a CSV file. I can type. And here's my CSV file, where I get the frequency, the gain, and the phase. The gain is in dBs, the phase is in degrees. So if I like, if I go back to the, the scope view, you'll notice that it's basically at that highest frequency sine wave, 100 kilohertz, and so if I like, uh, I can go back to what I had before, which was 100 kilosamples per second, and a frequency of about, oh, I don't know, 500 hertz. So that's a period of 2 milliseconds. And there's my step response. My amplitude is now basically plus or minus 1, one volt my offset. If I like, I could um, rearrange things here. Um, and make a high pass filter. So to do that, I want to drive this into the capacitor. And I'm going to want to connect the resistor ground rail instead. And now I have a classic high pass filter response where I put a step in, let me move my uh, blue signal up so you can actually see So you can see that my input step is centered at 2.5, but my output waveform is centered around 0. So it always returns back to ground, which is where I've connected that end of my resistor. So the step, the fast part, goes straight through the capacitor. And you can see that I step up by basically uh, 2 volts, and so my output goes up by 2 volts, and then as the waveform is steady here, nothing is moving, and so there's no current through the capacitor, and that voltage, that initial 2 volt step, decays away back down to ground. And then if I step down, that very fast 2 volt step in the downward direction couples straight through the capacitor, and I go down to minus 2 volts, and then as this is steady, the input's steady, it's not changing, no current flows through the capacitor, and my capacitor basically discharges back up to ground, and it just keeps doing that, okay? If I go and I change the DC level of my input waveform, you can see that the, the output doesn't really care, doesn't notice, it always returns back to ground. That's classical high-pass 
filter sort of time domain behavior. If I like, I can also do, I could save, save this. So if I like, I can give you do high pass. Step. I could also do a Bodhi plot on this. So let's do the same range. And here, at low frequencies, much below the corner, we're attenuating. So we're down by two decades, because we're two decades in frequency below the corner. And then as we get up to the corner and, and above the corner, we can see that the gain is zero dBs and the phase shift is zero. And that's classical sort of first order high pass filter behavior. If we like, we can save this. as well. So here we are at 100, kilo, 100 kilohertz frequency and the input and the output waveform are exactly the same. If we were to manually reduce the frequency, you can see that as I reduce the frequency further, they get more and more out of phase. Output waveform gets smaller in amplitude. As is reflected in the Bodhi plot. Okay. So um, say 500 hertz step and let's put this back up at 100 kilo samples per second. A couple of other things that we can do here. We can uh, do some measurements, some simple rudimentary measurements. We can um, get some cursors, some horizontal cursors, and we can measure a time difference between the two cursors. That's useful for measuring things like delays, propagation delays, or the period of a waveform. Just drag them back and forth, and if I drag, you might see the difference between the two up here, halfway between them. You can also do vertical cursors, which Allow me to measure the voltage amplitudes. And that's displayed over here on the right hand side. You can also grab the axis here to move things up and down, like to, to scroll the waveform, or you, you can scroll the, the horizontal scale back and forth like this instead of using the arrow keys or the uh, pan and zoom menu. So if I pan, I can pan left and right if I like. But I can also just grab the, the axis and drag it back and forth. I can drag this trigger point back and forth and it does the same thing. Um, that's why I moved the, that's why I panned up a little bit because when the, when you try to grab the cursors and they're down here, you'll wind up grabbing the axis instead. And so to actually grab the cursor and move it up and down, you kind of have to have it away from uh, the axis, otherwise you'll drag the axis instead of the cursor. Okay, um, so last thing I think that I want to go through right now is some stuff about the digital headers. So let me 
get rid of this green wire here. And let me measure D0 with channel 1. channel 2 I'm going to connect to D0 up to my blue LED there we go Okay. And let me just go to the home view and zoom in again. One, two, three, four, five, or four, one, two, three, four, five, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, so now I've got a zero to five volt roughly 0 to 5 volt, minus 0.5 to 4.5 volt span on each of my two channels. And um, I'm looking at a couple of the digital outputs. And this last pullout up here, which we haven't looked at yet, is, uh, no, actually it's this one down here, is the digital control panel. Um, and I can Right now, by default, they all start out as just simple digital outputs, which I can change the level of by clicking on this button here. So D0 is what channel 1 is looking at. And you can see that as I click on D0, it turns the LED on, and I can see that channel 1 has gone uh, high, uh, which Again, it's 3.3 volts, so you can see it's here, 3.123. And if I like, I can do the same thing with D1, which is channel 2. In the picture, you can also see that as I change D1 to high, it turns the, the blue LED on. So there are different modes I can put my digital I.O. pins in. So there's output. But if I click on that, there's a little pop-up down here that lets me change to uh, be a digital input, be a pulse width modulated output, or a servo output. So um, the only thing I'm going to talk about right now is the PWM output. So PWM stands for pulse, pulse width modulated. And that basically gives me a, a digital square wave whose frequency and um, something called duty cycle I can adjust. So the duty cycle is the fraction of the period that the signal is high. So by default, I get a 1 kilohertz waveform with a 50% duty cycle. And I have these little sliders here, which I can use to change that. So if I like, I can change the frequency to 2 kilohertz, or I can go down to 500 hertz. And you can see that the waveform changes accordingly. Can also change the duty cycle if I like. I can make it, let's say, I don't know, 25%. And so now you can see that the waveform is high for one quarter of the period and low for three quarters of the period. If I change it to 75%, you can see that it's high for three quarters of the period and low for uh, one quarter of the period. Now it's interesting because if you look um, at the blue LED in the physical picture of what's going on. You can see this, I changed the duty cycle, high to low, the LED gets dimmer or brighter. So you can't perceive the individual flashing of the LED. Your eye sort of averages it out, and so you perceive sort of the average voltage or you perceive the, actually it's the average current through the LED as a brightness, a steady brightness. And this is how things like dimmers work on LED lighting. They change the, the duty cycle of a pulse width modulated control signal. Again, 
these little uh, buttons over here allow me to change snapping on and off so I can change this also in a more continuous way. By default it allows me to only go in steps of 5%. If I like something that's a little more continuous I can turn the snapping off, turn it on. You can also do the same thing with the uh, frequency. Again the frequency is still logarithmic. If I have snapping on it, it does one, two, five, ten. And there's also some user indicator LEDs here. So there's a green one, LED one is green, LED two is red, LED three is blue. So if I turn on the uh, the red and the blue, you get magenta. If I turn on green and red you get yellow so that's fun doesn't really do very much functionally if you are in kind of a red mood you can turn the red light on it's kind of like Christmas red and green um, if I like let me switch this back to output if I like um, I can change D1 to an input, and I can show you something here with D0. So I've, I've connected D1 up to D0, so now D1 does whatever D0 does. And you can see that if a signal is an input, the button is deactivated here in the digital control pane but it uh, lights up in response to a change in the input signal. So if I make D0 low, D1 sort of is off, and if I make D1 high, it's indicated by this deactivated button turning blue. Okay. So um, that's it for this video. Um, I'm sure there'll be some others coming that explain some more things about this, but that should be enough to get us started for the time being. Thanks for watching.